be awesome. Well, we're in week number four of a series called The Parables of Jesus. And uh, in this series, it's been kind of incredible to see some of the things that Jesus had to say. Uh, do you guys, hold on, let me find my notes for this. Do you guys know what this picture is right here? Uh, it's called the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Do we have that picture, Callan? There it is. Pizza, sorry, the Leaning Tower. I got pizza on the brain. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this before. You've seen this picture before. This was built somewhere around 1100 A.D. by an architect that drew it all up. And they poured the foundation for it. And as they started to build it, they realized that they didn't set the foundation of this building properly. It took them about 180 years to complete this. This is actually a bell tower for a cathedral that was standing in front of it. And as they built it over those 180 years, they did everything they could to try to correct this leaning tower. They shored up the foundation. They even, if you notice at the top, it kind of curves a little bit. They built the top to a little bit of a curve to try to make it look right. But it didn't matter because the foundation of the leaning tower of Pisa was wrong. And it's made it some 18 feet off center. And what the people that know a lot about buildings and stuff like this will tell you is one day this building is going to fall. All because the foundation that it was built on was not done right. As I read that this week, it made me think about the parable we're going to. We're going to look at the parable this week of the rock and the sand. We're going to go to the gospel of Matthew chapter 7. The gospels are kind of interesting because there are four different gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in these four different gospels, uh, they are written in a way that are not contradictory, but they really give four different viewpoints, if you will. When you're reading the gospels, think of it like this. Every gospel is a camera, and it's shooting the same scene, but it's shooting it from a totally different angle. Uh, every gospel was written for different types of people from a different perspective because they were written by someone different. The gospel of Mark, for instance, was written to the Romans, and it gives a picture of Jesus as the perfect servant. Uh, he was hardworking. The word that you will see constantly through the gospel of Mark, that's the favorite word of the gospel, if you will, is the word immediately. You see it constantly. Immediately Jesus went here. Immediately Jesus went there. Immediately Jesus did this. And there is a rapid sequence of events. And he doesn't waste any time because Jesus is a great servant on his work. The Gospel of Luke was written for the Greeks at the time. And it portrays Jesus as the perfect man. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie 300 before. Raise your hand. But remember, the Greeks were known to even take the babies with deformities and throw them out because they were constantly in pursuit of the perfect man and the perfect woman. And so this is written from the perspective of Jesus being the perfect man. And the favorite phrase that you will see in the book of Luke is the phrase, Son of Man, over and over and over, Son of Man. Luke does a great job of looking at the human side of Jesus. He really tells us about Jesus' emotions and how he felt and his manhood. The Gospel of John was written not just for a group of people. It was really written for the whole world if you read the Gospel of John. And the focus of the Gospel of John was really on the deity or the godhood of Jesus. And it helps us to understand who he really is. The favorite word used in the book of John as a result of that is the word believe. Believe in Jesus because he is God. Over a hundred times you'll find the word believe. Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, which is where we're going today, it was written to the Jewish people. 
And the Gospel of Matthew, the entire focus of the Gospel of Matthew is showing Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament as the Messiah. The favorite phrase in the Gospel of Matthew that we will find is the phrase, this was done that it might be fulfilled. Over and over, it's referring back to these Old Testament passages. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. As a result of being written to the Jews and referring to the Old Testament, the Gospel of Matthew spends the most amount of time on Jesus' sermons. We refer to him theologically as Jesus' discourses, his talks that he gave. The Gospel of Matthew spends the most amount of time on what Jesus had to say about Scripture and his teaching. Matthew 5 through 7 is probably the most popular discourse or the most popular sermon that Jesus ever gave. It's the sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount starts, and Jesus starts to teaching with the Beatitudes, very beautiful sayings that Jesus gave. Blessed are the meek, blessed are these people, blessed are these people, for they will find the kingdom of God. It moves on in Matthew chapter 5 about halfway through or a third of the way through, and, and Jesus starts to teach on scriptural foundations. He talks about things like proclaiming truth, correcting falsehood. It's where we get our sayings about murder adultery, divorce. He talks about oaths. He talks about forgiving people. He gives us insight on how we're supposed to deal with our relationships. Matthew chapter 6 through 7, Jesus talks about right living. How are we supposed to live a life that honors God? But in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24 and going through verse 29, don't miss this. After the greatest sermon that was ever preached, Jesus gets into his altar call. This is his closing parable, closing story, if you will. Any preacher will tell you what my grandfather used to always tell me about sermons. You can preach the greatest sermon ever, but if you have a horrible closing and a horrible altar call, you miss the whole thing. Conversely, I could get up here and make absolutely no sense at all to you guys, but if, if God leads me to a great altar call and a great closing example, for many of us, it will click and it will, we'll walk away going, wow. This is Jesus' altar call moment. This is the bring it home moment that Jesus is giving us for the Sermon on the Mount. This is the applicational side. This is where Jesus says, okay, everything I've been talking about, now the rubber meets the road, and I'm going to connect it all with this parable about rock and sand. I know you've heard this parable before, but don't miss the context of this. In Matthew chapter 7, this is what it says in verse 24. We're going to start there. Y'all with me? Say, I am. I know you've heard this story before, but listen today. It's going to be quick. It's going to be simple, but just listen. Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, what words? The Sermon on the Mount that I just like went through with you. All the stuff that he's just said and all the stuff that he's just taught. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Everybody say wise man. One, two, three. Wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man. Let's say foolish man on the count of three. One, two, three. Foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, Because he taught as one who had authority and not 
as their teachers of the law. When Jesus gives this parable, this story that we're supposed to learn a biblical truth from and a spiritual truth from, it goes without saying that he's not concerned with construction or building code violations. He's concerned with our life, he's concerned with our families, and he's concerned with our church. What Jesus is saying in this parable is, you've listened to the sermon. You've sat through what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. But he's trying to jar the people with this ending parable and get them to understand, don't just listen to another sermon and walk out of here and not apply it. Don't just come to church and leave not changed. Listen to the words that I've said and apply them. He gives a story of two men that have several similarities. Some of the similarities we see with these guys, they are like-minded in the sense that both of them had a dream. Both of them had a dream to build a house. Both of them did. When you look at houses in Scripture, houses represent different things. And these are the things that Jesus is referring to. The first thing in Scripture that we see a house represents or building something represents is your life. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, listen to what it says, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable through Jesus Christ. So he's speaking about building your life. Secondly, he's speaking about building a family. The Greek word that's used in this text for the word house is a word, I believe it's pronounced oikos, O-I-K-O-S. The definition of this word is family, lineage, or nation. Those are the nouns that are used to describe this word. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to build a family, you better listen. You better build it on the rock and not on sand. Thirdly, it's referring to a ministry or a church. If you remember in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus started his church, he said, upon this, what did he say? Rock, I will build my church. The Greek word is Petra. The exact same word used in this scripture for rock is used in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is saying, he's, when he talks about building a house, another thing he's referring to is a building of a ministry or a building of a church. In the Bible, it is referred to as the house of God. In the New Testament, it's referred to as the household of faith. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.11. It says, encourage one another in the context of the church and build each other up. We've got a life that he's referring to. We've got family that he's referring to. We have the church that he's referring to. And finally, we have a society that he is referring to. Old Testament, the nation of Israel is referred to as a house. Again, the Greek word for this, the noun, one of the nouns that describes the word house is a society. So both of them have a dream to build a life, to build a family in a society that's built on something solid and hopefully build a ministry. Both of these guys, another similarity, they both sat under Jesus' teaching. I heard one person say, Jesus is probably referring to two believers, not two unbelievers. We tend to think the person that built on sand is someone that was lost. Most likely not unless they just rejected the gospel. But what did he say? 
Everyone who hears these words of mine, we at least know they sat underneath Jesus' teaching. Another similarity, they both faced storms. Both of them have waters come, the streams rise, and they had storms in their life. Every single person in here, including the ones watching online, Every single one of us are going to be similar to these two men in regards to we all are going to face storms. Every single one of us, you can put on your Christian face. You can walk in on Sunday morning and act like everything's all good and you're fine and dandy and sweet as candy. But the reality is... I dare say the majority of people sitting under the sound of my voice right now have some junk and some storms going on in their life right this second that they are struggling through. None of us are exempt from storms. Storms will hit every single person in here. In fact, when you read the words of Jesus, I know we've pitched it to you like this. We've, we've tried to make you think, like, if you get saved, man, your life's going to be great. You'll have health. You'll have wealth. All your problems will be taken care of. You'll never struggle smoking cigarettes again. That'll be gone. You'll never want to smack your wife again. That'll be gone. You'll never want to kill your kids again. That'll be... I mean, y'all know that ain't true. Amen, y'all? Like, everything's just going to be perfect. That ain't going to happen. Jesus said one thing you're guaranteed more of if you put your trust in him is persecution and storms that are going to happen in your life. we got something in common with these two men, don't we? Every single person in here wants to build a good life, wants to build a good family, wants to live in a built society. Every single one of us, if we're Christians, we want God to build the church. We want God to build our ministry. Every single uh, one of us are going to face storms. Every single one of us are sitting under Jesus' teaching. And every single one of us has a choice on what our foundation in our life is going to be. The difference that I find in these two men, there's only one. There's only one. But it's a big one. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a big one. Here we go. One's wise, one's a fool. Major distinction between these two is one is full of wisdom and one is full of foolishness. Wisdom can be defined as this. The ability or the willingness to apply biblical truth to life's decisions. Foolishness, in turn, can be described as this. The inability or refusal to apply biblical truth to life's decisions. You want to know if you're wise or if you're a fool. Ask yourself, where is God in my decision making. Do I look at the Bible and before I do anything, ask myself, according to this book, what decision am I supposed to make? Because this parable is telling us that's going to determine the foundation that your life is built on. That's going to determine the foundation that your family is built on. That's going to determine the foundation that our church will be built on. Are we going to build it on rock or are we going to build it on sand? When you build a life or a family or a church on rock, it's a slow process. It takes time. It takes Money takes patience, takes hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. When you build 
something on sand, a house on sand, a life on sand, a family on sand. Man, you can do it overnight. It's quick. It, it happens fast. It's cheap. It doesn't cause much sacrifice at all. You guys remember the story of the three little pigs? Remember the story of the three little pigs? One pig built their house out of straw, I think. One pig built their house out of wood. Another pig built their house out of a strong foundation. I know brick. Don't You know what I mean? I know, I know that's what it says. But ultimately, a strong foundation. And when the big bad wolf, the big bad enemy, the one who wanted to steal, kill, and destroy them came, the only one that stood was the one whose foundation was solid. So it goes in our lives, in our life, in our family, and in our church. Last year, when we built this wall right here, we tore down a wall that was around right here. Do y'all remember that? Anybody remember that? We tore one down right here. We had a big plastic sheet up forever, and then we had to move the wall over and we had so much fun at the expansion. I'm so glad we're in the middle of another one. Amen, y'all. And so, so y'all that ain't helping are the ones that said amen, right? And so, but when we built that wall, I came in one day and I saw bullet, uh, bullet shells, like bullets laying on the ground. And I asked Mark, who was over the build for us, who did such an amazing job. I said, were y'all shooting guns in here? Like, what's going on? And he told me, he said, no, when we set the studs for that wall in the ground, they actually use a gun that has 22 shells that shoots the bolts down into the concrete. I didn't know that. I was amazed. It's literally like you're shooting a gun off and a bullet off to set those. If I'm wrong about this, I think it's the studs, you know, that they're setting in the ground. And I think it's 22 shells. I'm not real sure. I'm a city boy. But, but I was amazed when I found that out. Imagine if we had come in here and set that wall and said, where's the gorilla tape and the super glue? And that, that's pretty sturdy. We'll, we'll, we'll set that wall up and then we'll trust that that wall is not going to fall over on all those kids you hear over there or fall this way and crush everybody in this section. You guys over here like, that's all right with us. But you know what I mean? I don't know. That's what Jesus is saying. Build your life with a 22 shell that's setting the studs in the ground. Don't use super glue. Don't do that. This, this parable really ministered to me because it takes time to build on the rock. And for every expansion we've ever done as a church, it's always been like, man, we get to work. We get the sledgehammers out. We start hanging up drywall. We start doing everything. Well, now we're like at a new level of attendance, and you have to make sure architects are involved, and you have to get certified builders, and you got to get all this stuff. And if you guys know anything about me, you know I'm the guy who wants it done last year. Like, this expansion should have been done in 2015. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my thought process, and I get real impatient, and this really ministered to me this week because it's like the Lord was saying, it's going to take time, Josh. Anything worth doing is uphill. It's going to take time. It takes patience. It takes sacrifice. You've got to calm down and you've got to let me take control of this thing. Amen. What Jesus is saying in this parable is, are you going to do what Jesus says to do? Are you going to follow the Bible as it pertains to every single area of your life? What he says about relationships, what he says about money, what he says about how you're supposed to treat your boss, what he says about church involvement, what he says about how you're supposed to treat uh, your wife or your husband, what he says about how you're supposed to respect authority, what he says about how you're supposed to respect your parents, what he says about how you're supposed to involve yourself with any kind of drugs or alcohol or prescriptions. I'm going to tell you all one of the major concerns I have in Crossville, Tennessee. Y'all with me? Say I am. If you got to leave, you can leave early because I may go a little over because I wouldn't plan on saying this. 
But as I look around this county, I think that Christians, especially the ones that come to church every single Sunday and sit in these pews, they've got an addiction and they don't think it's a big deal and it's alcohol. I get what the Bible says. We taught on it years ago. I shot a video in a bar. You guys know how I feel about it. If you don't know, come ask me. I'll tell you. But there are several of us that are being oppressed by what the Bible refers to in the Greek as the spirit of pharmakia. It's where we get the word pharmacy. In the Bible, it's translated as sorcery. And what it literally means, the definition of it is the abuse of drugs. I'm not hooked on meth, but please hear me. Everybody with me say amen. amen. Made me feel good. Like just, just look at, just say good job, Josh. One, two, three. Good job. Thank you. You know, I'm not hooked on meth, but I drink a case of beer every Friday night, another case every Saturday night. It is absolutely destroying you. It's okay. It's absolutely destroying you. And you need to repent. And you need to allow God to reset your foundation. Are you going to listen to Him as it pertains to that? Are you going to listen to Him as it pertains to the things that the Bible is clear about that should be saved for two people inside the context of a heterosexual marriage? Are you going to listen? Or are you just going to build it on sand? Shifting. I heard one preacher tell a story about how he had cracks in his wall a crack in his wall and he called a painter to come paint over the crack and fix the crack and about a month later the crack reappeared and it was wider than it was and so he was pretty upset he called the painter and said hey man you didn't fix this come back and paint over it again he came back and paint over, painted over it again about a month or two later the crack was back but there were several other cracks that were with it he got upset and he called somebody else because he thought the guy did a horrible job this new guy came out and and looked at his, uh, his problem, and he said, I can't help you, I'm just a painter. He said, what do you mean? I'm paying you to fix this. He said, no, 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 no. The problem is the foundation. The cracks in your wall are a symptom of the shifting foundation underneath your home. I think for so many of us, the reason our life is so unstable and we have so many cracks is because we have a shifting foundation underneath us that is anti-biblical. It's no wonder. It's no wonder. There's drama and there's pain and there's heartache. Some of us spend our entire lives painting over cracks that are the result of a poor foundation. They're just a symptom of us making foolish and unwise decisions. Listen to James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Another way to put that. All the people that listen to these words that I've spoken today are either going to apply it and be wise or walk out the door with nothing changed and be fools. Y'all ready for some good news? Say amen. Because y'all are like loving this so far. Like, here's the good news. The good news is we all have cracks, but Jesus plasters us back together and resets our foundation. Amen, Rev Church? Here's the good news, is that we have a cornerstone to our foundation. You see how this building theme runs through the New Testament? 
And the Bible refers to it as Jesus. I want you to listen to Psalm 118, 22. This is a prophecy about Jesus. The cornerstone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, referring to Jesus. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Get the lights, and I'll be done here in just a second. Y'all still with me? Say amen. amen. No, we're going a little bit over. What's your life look like? You kind of like this? Leaning a little bit? Poor foundation? Or are you solid? I believe at Revolution Church this weekend, there are people that need to do business with God and reset the foundation of their life to something solid. You're tired of patching cracks. You're sick of calling painters to try to fix it and only a few months later realizing uh, it sprung back up again and there's five more cracks to go with it this time. It's time for you to set the foundation. Stop waiting. Stop putting it off. Stop thinking that things are going to get better. Right now is the time to commit yourself to the words of Jesus, to commit yourself to living right, to commit yourself to living in such a way that honors God. Commit your life, commit your family, commit our church to being built on the rock of Jesus. I was reading a, uh, <laughs> a blog this week that referred to a study where uh, it's estimated that every single one of us that has a Netflix account spends an average of 18 minutes a day not even watching anything, just searching through Netflix. Anybody ever been there before? Like you're looking and you're looking and you think to yourself, man, it was so much easier when there was three channels and I just had to watch one of those. You know what I'm saying? Now I got too many choices. This same study said that 40% of some people's, the majority of people, when they're on Netflix, 40% of the time, they're not even watching anything. They're searching for something to watch. Just looking, just looking, just searching. Not getting to binge watch nothing, not watching anything. Same study said that over 60% of the time when there's two people watching something on Netflix, one of them, doesn't want to watch what the other person is watching. Wives and husbands, raise your hand. Yes, yes. Me and Brooke are with you. I just say that to bring this home. Some of y'all, man, you're just, you're like you've been searching a long time. You come to church, and I get that you're here. Praise Jesus that you're here, but, but you've never said, boom, this is what I'm watching. I'm making a decision now. You're here to please somebody. You're here to get your religiosity in. You were raised this way, and it makes you feel pretty good to go to church. But when it comes to building your life on the rock, being fully committed to Jesus, giving everything to Him, your life, your family, your church, everything to Him, you've never done that. You're just searching, flipping. Yeah, maybe there's something good. And I believe Jesus this weekend is calling some people to radical discipleship, to radically follow Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As I pray this prayer, make this your prayer if you need to. Lord, we are a broken people. We are messed up. We cannot get it straight. God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could build our life on a solid foundation. God, there are people in here, including myself, that struggle with taking the easy way out, with hot pocket Christianity, with consumerism, 
coming and sitting in a service, watching the the verses on a screen, but never applying anything you tell us to our lives. There are people sitting in here right now that feel like their entire life has been on shifting sand. They've never had consistency. consistency. They've never had something solid in their life. There's all these cracks that have been forming as a result of a foundation that is constantly shifting. I pray, God, right now for every single person in here, God, that we commit to building our life, to building our family, to building this church on a solid foundation, on Petra, on the rock that is Jesus Christ, on your words, on biblical truth. I pray right now for the people under the sound of my voice that struggle with alcoholism, They can't be in a social situation unless they loosen themselves up with a few beers. Every single weekend is a party to them and all they're trying to do, God, is numb the pain, ignore uh, the hurt, get away from a situation, God, that right now they would repent, that you would set them free from alcoholism, God, that they wouldn't need it anymore, that they would commit to building their life on the rock, understanding that it's going to take time, it's going to take sacrifice, it is not going to be easy. I pray right now for every single person under the sound of my voice that is involved in gross sexual sin. Porneia is what you refer to it in the scriptures as. And it encompasses anything outside the context of what you give it in Scripture. I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that has perverted your word and what the relationship between a man and a woman should be built on, that they repent, that they turn away, they put their trust in you, and they follow what your word says in that area, understanding that it's going to take time, It's not going to be easy. It's going to take sacrifice. It could cost them money. It could cost them government assistance. It could cost them to have to double their rent, whatever it is, God. We want your will to be done in your people today. Help us, God. Help me (laughs) to apply biblical truths to my decision-making. Help us, Lord, not to be foolish. We love you, Lord. You are awesome and you are mighty. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. We are so glad that you've joined us online today and checked out Revolution Church. You can find us on Facebook and actually go like our page if you want to keep up with the church. Or you can join our text club, text Rev Church to 62582. If you have questions, if you'd like to talk to someone, if you have prayer requests, just email us at office at crossvillerevolution.com or you can call our church at 931-248-6441. Thank you so much.